So here we are in the last day of the conference of uh, science and non-duality in Holland 2012. Uh, there has been a lot of presentations that have been very interesting for me because what is happening here is we're trying to find out how we can describe the subjective experience of the world at the same time as describing the objective reality out there and this has always been a challenge to find uh, mm -hmm. a unified model that could include both the inner and outer, the subjective and the objective. And uh, with me is uh, Ulisse Di Corpo from Italy that has presented even mathematical equations of how emotions that I claim are the motivators for, for doing something can be expressed mathematically. Yes. Please, okay. Lisa, well, um, what's your background? I'm, I'm a psychologist, uh, experimental psychologist, and a, a PhD in statistics. Well, in, for various different reasons, I got interested in a mathematical um, model which was developed by Luigi Fantapia in 1941. And the point of this model is that um, physicists have rejected in the 1930s half of the solutions of the fundamental equations of physics. Um, the reason is that um, in these solutions we have two um, different trends in energy. Uh, the positive solution describes energy which diverges from the past to the future and is governed by the law of entropy and we have a causality that uh, precedes effects. The second solution instead describes energy which diverges backwards in time from the future to the past. And it describes for us that we're moving forward in time, energy that concentrates the increase in, in complexity, differentiation, structures and order. And uh, the mathematical properties of this negative solution are exactly the properties of living beings. So what Fantapie uh, said and in 1941 is that these mathematical equations allow to arrive to a unitary theory of the physical and biological world. The physical uh, world would be a consequence of causes placed in the past whereas the biological world uh, would be the consequence of causes which retroact from the future. Well, his theory, even if he was one of the biggest, greatest genius, mathematical geniuses of last century, he was working with Einstein, Enrico Fermi, became a member of the Institute for Advanced Studies in Princeton, so he, he really was in the elite. Well, the fact that he suggested that causality could work in a different way from the classical cause and effect model uh, was not accepted. And his theory of syntropy, this unitary theory, uh, in a way um, just um, got in oblivion, it, it was forgotten. And the other problem was that he could, uh, was not able to devise experiments that sh could prove that causality was moving backwards in time with living um, systems. Now, in recent years, it has become possible to do this kind of experiments thanks to random event generators. It is possible to manipulate future causes in a totally unpredictable way in the past and see if there is a correlation between what is going to happen in the past and what we have measured, uh, what, is, what going is going to happen in the future and what we have measured in the past. And this correlation is extremely strong when we get in account the autonomic nervous system. For example, measures like heart rate and skin conductance. And that would mean that this backward in time energy, uh, we would acquire it through the autonomic nervous system and experience it in the form of feelings. Uh, consequently, we would be in between 
um, saying information that comes from the past, like quantitative and objective information that we can uh, process with our brain, and information coming from the future that we experience in the form of feeling, feeling that direct our behavior towards a aim in a um, uh, that orient our behavior. So from and the past we have memories and thoughts. And we have quantitative and objective information. From yeah. the future yeah. we have subjective and qualitative Emotions information. Emotions from the future, yes. thoughts from yes. memories. And from we are the constantly uh, in a way uh, in a state of choice because we have to choose between what the head tells us and what the yeah. uh, <laughs> autonomic nervous system, the yeah. heart, is pointing towards. Now, because our culture has focused on the brain, we usually uh, follow, say, our thoughts. We follow computation, we follow rationality, and we don't give a, the appropriate attention to these feelings that would direct our uh, uh, choices and behavior. And this means that the negative solution is governed by entropy. And, and negative is just because there is a minus. There is no sort of, of no, it's negative not, value. No, it's not a negative. Uh, value uh, no, no, okay. it's, it's mathematically uh, From minus. a mathematical point of view, uh, the equations are solved uh, using a square root. And square roots yeah. always have a positive solution and a negative solution. And the negative solution has negative time. So time flows backwards in time. No, Crazy. No, yes. <laughs> no, that would mean that uh, the time we experience, this sequential time, is just one type of time, because in reality, uh, past, present and future would, at least at the quantum level, coexist, be a uh, unitary time. Hmm. Now, what I was saying before is that if we follow only the thoughts which are governed by the cause and effect logic, by the forward in time solution which diverges, what we get to are we develop solutions that are governed by the law of entropy. So if we produce policies mm. which are just based on the rational um, approach, mm. then we'll uh, get uh, as a consequence an increase in, in, in entropy mm -hmm. and this is what is happening a bit everywhere in uh, uh, in industries uh, in in the economics uh, but also in politics we see a constant increase of entropy disorder and um, and, and crisis in one way we, we seem to get more organized on the surface yes but, but there is something maybe some, behind. Some, something missing yeah now, um, uh, so according to this model, uh, feelings and emotions can be very important in, uh, in order to direct our behavior. And uh, often when we find the right direction, we uh, experience what, is, what are, is named intuition. It's a kind of knowledge which it doesn't stem from rationalities. It's totally different and new and it's strongly uh, correlated to emotions. Now, according to this um, entropy, syntropy model, um, life would be only partially material. Mm -hmm. And uh, because of uh, our material body, we have material needs. We have to contrast the law of entropy and so we have to acquire energy, we have to acquire matter to uh, because our structure needs to be uh, regenerated, but if we just acquire matter, uh, we don't understand how to how the regenerative processes hmm. take place, hmm. and so uh, we, beside matter, we need, according to this model, to acquire also syntropy, hmm. which is say a kind of immaterial. Uh, level of reality but which would be the fundamental level of life and as a consequence of this model we have other two vital needs between, uh, uh, next to the material needs we have a need of cohesion and unity because syntropy has a unitary property 
and when we acquire it, we converge. And how we experience uh, the, this acquisition of syntropy, because it converges energy and it's linked to the autonomic nervous system, we experience feeling, feelings of warmth in this area of the body uh, associated to well-being. And usually these feelings are, are named love, feelings of love. Mm. Instead, when we are not acquiring syntropy, entropy prevails and we feel emptiness, uh, chill, cold and feelings of, uh, say, suffering. Depression? Uh, usually this is co called anxiety, angst. Oh, okay. And uh, when, when you stay in that, you can get depressed? Yes, uh, but it's strictly correlated to depression. Depression, according to this model, is uh, something different. Okay. Because syntropy is converging, mm -hmm. uh, our consciousness would be very, uh, say, uh, localized. We feel to be very small, localized, but entropy has inflated the universe towards infinite. And when we compare ourselves to the universe, which is infinite, we realize that we are equal to zero. So there is a conflict that originates b between our feeling of existence, the mm. fact that syntropy provides us with this kind of feeling of existence, and the fact that comparing ourselves to this immense uh, universe, we are, we realize, we become aware that we are equal to nothing. And that is what, you know, uh, Shakespeare des described as to be or not to be. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That is the problem. And that is one of the key problems of every person, that if we don't solve this identity conflict, we yeah. have the consumption of en uh, energy, yeah. we feel it in the, uh, as depression, as mm. being meaningless, and, um, and we go towards, say, destruction, suicide, or, you know. And, mm. and we will try to fill the, the emptiness with material stuff. Yes, what that, that um, consume even more of resources. What, 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 what happens is, if you see it as an equation, it is a very simple equation because you have myself, I, compared to the universe, I'm equal to zero. And uh, uh, what people try to do is to increase the numerator of this equation, ah. for example, um, um, expanding their ego. Yeah. And that means uh, uh, buying material uh, objects or um, increasing their wealth, their power, uh, Control, uh, yeah. and and all this uh, goes through the consumption of material um, objects, a material consumption which is not necessary for survival and for life and for a good quality life. The best things in life are free. They yes, sing. yes, yes. <laughs> so what uh, we get to is that uh, often the um, kind of um, uh, difficulties we have in economics are not really a consequence of, um, say, economical difficulties, but it's a consequence of the fact that because people want to provide a meaning, they have this vital meaning of a, a vital need of providing a meaning to their existence, they become selfish, they want to accumulate, and, um, and how the world should uh, propagate, circulate in the economical system is ruined by this uh, need of uh, providing a meaning to our life. So we, we, we can never really find meaning on that way. We, no, we, 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 we try to fill the emptiness, but we'll never find well, the, the, uh, you know, you, the goal. You can uh, increase the numerator as much as you want, yeah. but when you compare it to the infinite of the universe, you're always equal to zero. So that is not the road. The only road to solve this identity con conflict is when we unite ourselves with the universe. Because yeah. when I... Yeah unite myself with the universe, <laughs> you take universe, universe, yeah. and you're equal yeah. to I. So the identity, we find it only through union, which is the... On a subjective plane. Uh, which is the property of cohesion, of love, yeah. of syntropy. Yeah. And that tells you another thing, is that the aim is this aim of union, of love, according to this model. Yeah. And we can um, reach this aim only 
uniting syntropy and entropy because the universe is entropy, is yeah, inflation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Ourself is syntropy. Hmm. Only when we unite these two polarities, hmm. we get to our meaning. So both hmm. yeah, syntropy yeah. and entropy are necessary yeah. in this model. It's not that syntropy is good and entropy is bad. You know about Ken Wilber? Mm, no. I well, but he's, he's saying the same thing. Yes, mm. well, but at the same time, it's important to say that the uh, ev evolutionary trend of life is that of maximizing syntropy, and um, we can see that in the energy resources that we are using now. They are mainly coming from biological masses, uh, for example, petroleum, gas, coal, and that shows that w what life does it concentrates energy and energy concentration is syntropy mm. syntropy is energy concentration so what naturally life does is that we tend to maximize syntropy so if we want to go towards economical uh, well-being mm. and personal well-being one of the laws would be that of maximizing this mm, the properties that uh, govern this law of syntropy and but this is done through this continuous process of entropy and syntropy mm. so in a way we we evolve entropy destroys what we have done mm. and we have to go further on and according to this model any crisis is an opportunity yeah. because it forces us to yeah. revisit all our uh, uh, certainties and, and the, the, the comforting thing is also to me that this mm. connects to every teaching of wisdom yes, from, yes. from ancient times. Yes. And, and the Veda tradition maybe is one of the most fully uh, yes. well, comprehensive um, this was theory. You know, uh, uh, Fantapia was a mathematician, mm -hmm. a science man, but he really was um, in a way amazed on how he could find his message mm. that he found through mathematics mm. which was m fundamentally a message of love I would say mm. because syntropy in a way would be the energy of life but would be also the energy of love mm. that it's guiding us and uh, and he could find the same message in um, uh, in, in Christianity but also in the Quran and in all the major mm. um, <coughs> religious and spiritual traditions yeah. so in a way something that everyone has ever we, we know it from millenniums yeah. Yeah. but science has uh, forgot it because the experimental method on which science is based requires quantitative and objective data and when you can only use quantitative and objective data you're forced to be only on the positive solution which propagates from the past to the future. And that means that even if, if the technology is extremely useful, when it is developed in this way, it will inevitably end increasing entropy. Yes. So, so the, the new reality we want to create needs to be in accordance with our emotions yes with our uh, emotions with subjective and qualitative data now um economist and philosopher of the 18th century and, and, excuse me and and we have to revise what we're doing really because we i, I don't think we can really have any chance of reaching what we're aiming for if we don't revise first what has been happening in me because what's out there is a reflection of yes that, the that, is, that is certainly true but we need to a new scientific uh, methodology paradigm yeah yeah and and that is already there we don't have to invent anything no. new because what we are using in our studies uh, instead of the um, method of differences on which it's based the uh, experiment uh, the methodology, we're using what is named the method of concomitances, which was devised by Stuart Mill in 1863. Okay. And this other method is a scientific method that allows you to study causality but also retro causality. Okay, yeah. And uh, it allows to put together quantitative and qualitative information, subjective and objective. 
because the problem is that usually science disregards your inner yeah. feelings and experiences. Yeah. It should because be kept away. Because, really. Yes, because it says I'm not able to measure it. Because no, so when it's, I ask it's not you, real. when I ask you, do you feel happy, depressed, or what? You'll provide me a subjective yeah. answer and not an objective one. But it's extremely interesting that with this new, this methodology which was devised by Stuart Mill, mm -hmm. uh, it is possible to handle in an incredibly interesting way all what is qualitative and subjective. And, so and you, you can also be with inquiry, you can ask people that are independent, yeah. what, yes. is your, what is your uh, experience? And there is actually a way also in that realm to uh, yeah, yeah, well, make some scientific evaluation. Well, now, uh, until now, psychologists were trying to uh, translate what it is qualitative in qu quantitative data. Mm. Psychological tests w are devised in order to tra translate qualitative in quantitative. Yeah. But what I'm saying is that we can use qualitative as mm. it is without having to translate it in quantitative. And, and this is what, uh, what the methodology that Stuart, Stuart Mill devised allows us to do. And what I think is in, in extremely important that this methodology gets into science, mm. because when you use only the uh, classical uh, experimental methodology, which, which is based on the study of differences, you get very unstable results. Mm -hmm. For example, in the pharmaceutical yeah, field, yeah, yeah. only 18% of the experiments, um, they find that uh, you're able to replicate the results as an average only in 18% of the cases. So 82% of the results that you get using the experimental method mm -hmm. in medicine mm -hmm. Mm, are not confirmed, they're no, no, not true, and we're based, therefore, on a knowledge which is not uh, a real, true knowledge. So medicine is just slightly better than placebo? Yes. It's, it's often might, claimed. And it might be even worse than placebo because it <laughs> often have toxic oh, yeah. effects that can... Mm -hmm. uh, another another realm that, that I think is interesting, uh, environmental economy is like a dichotomy in itself. Yes. Uh, when you put value on, on resources that are necessary for our survival. Yes. And uh, I think there's a lot of confusion about how we use environmental economy. Yes. Um, it's, it's a slightly different area, but, but uh, in some places it's, the, it's tried it's been tried to be it's used in a, in a bad way i think because we're quantifying stuff that should not be quantified yes now the, the the point is this is that because of this same classical approach where we only see the cause and effect logic uh, in economics usually we use a cost and benefit approach and that means that any information in order to evaluate it in order to assess uh, policy you have to translate it in a quantitative way yeah. and therefore give a value a quantitative value but uh, this is not always possible because uh, as I was saying before all what is the inner experience of the person is not no uh, there is no way to translate it from the qualitative to the quantitative uh, side and there are many other, for example, with nuclear power. If you see the cost and benefit mm. calculations, uh, what it happens is that you put put in the assessment process only what can be translated in the quantitative manner, yep. and whatever is not possible to translate it, it's uh, out of, of the equation. The, of the <laughs> equation, and that means you put the cost of the fuel, which is much more convenient than the other fuels not always you put the cost of construction of the um, say uh, the power plant because sometimes it's paid by the government and not by the um, private industries um, and the, the, the waste is is uh, that we need to be taken care of for well, a long that, time. Well, that, that is not included. That, that is that is included sometimes by by a trip 
pre depreciation factor yes. <coughs> that reduces the cost to present net value, which is very, very low. Well, if you think that now in the United States alone, the costs associated to nuclear waste, the handling of nuclear waste, is higher then the cost of education in the United States is higher now. The, the handling of new ways has reached higher cost than the education, and that tells you uh, how much entropy is associated to, uh, and, and how many costs are associated with that type of choice, <coughs> and which, which is not included uh, usually oh. in the cost and benefit assessments because nuclear waste will be handled by the government mm. and not by the private companies. Yeah. So what happens is that uh, costs which don't get into the equation, they, uh, they are often then given to the collectivity. Yeah. People have to weigh, pay for the cost that economists didn't uh, put in the equations. And that, that tends to happen in different areas, like with the, the money that is produced by private banks. Well, uh, when, when, when you and I don't take another uh, loan, yes. it will be the governments the people that will take the loan in, in, uh, yes, uh, well, in the uh, end. Well, that, you know, anyway, that, uh, that to, is, say, um, to save yes. the, the um, yeah, uh, that, uh, uh, that was not so until 1998 because there was a um, uh, the Stanley Act from 1932 that it was generally accepted worldwide uh -huh. that said that banks had to be divided in, in commercial banks and investment banks mm -hmm. And, and the government was guaranteeing uh, deposits of commercial banks. Uh, um, in 1998 in the USA, but in each country in a different year, this law was removed and this allowed to use uh, deposits of citizens for investments. Mm. And this took a huge amount of money in, uh, in the stock exchange everywhere in the world with high rises of quotations and everyone putting the money. But that was a way uh, to keep the growth uh, growing every year. Yes, but... So uh, it, it was the same system, but that, that sort of had, was outgrowing itself, yes, starting but, to collapse. Yes, so but in order I, I, to uh, you know, at a certain point stock exchanges started to fall and people yeah, yeah, then that, said, yeah. said, well, if stock exchanges do not guarantee my uh, money. I'll put it in in, in the uh, house in yeah. uh, in and the derivatives and, and whatnot in order to make yes. uh, the loans increase. Now, what, because that's what, the way we produce what, the what, growing money. What we have now and what became clear in 2008 is that this system has created a debt of the banks, which is of 800 trillion dollars, which is uh, that means 10 times higher of the uh, world uh, uh, year uh, uh, GNP GNP of the world because the GNP of the world is 60 trillions. Uh -huh. Now we have a debt of the banks which is 800 trillions. That is 10 times more than 10 times higher than the GDP of the world. And there is no way to repay that debt. And because of that debt that it has been in a way given to the governments. Uh, countries like Greece, uh, Iceland collapsed first and what the people said is we don't understand why we have to pay for a debt that was uh, caused by the bankers. Mm -hmm. Now Greece is falling apart, probably Italy will fall apart because of this mm -hmm. debt mm -hmm. and, um, and there is no way technically to repay uh, such a huge debt caused by uh, bad investment and use of the money. Yeah, and with a system that mathematically has to grow every year, right? Well, because uh, if it doesn't, it can never pay for the increasing interests. Yes, I, I think that we are on the verge of a big change. Yeah. Now, uh, there are some countries like Russia, China, 
South American countries and also Arabic countries which are suggesting to replace uh, to, to have a new Bretton Woods. Uh, yeah. the Bretton Woods was the place when, where in 1944 uh, the countries, that uh, the winner countries of the Second World War met and decided the rules of the monetary system. And the rules were that the international currency was the dollar and it was guaranteed by gold and all the other cur currencies were linked to the dollar. Yeah. And this system broke up uh, during the Vietnam War and, um, and it was replaced with the petrol dollar system. So the petrol was guaranteeing the dollar and all the other currencies were linked to the dollar. Now we have... Eliseo. What? <coughs> Eliseo. Ulisse. Uh, Ulisse. Uh, I think we could be talking for yes, uh, another 50 batteries. Yes, okay. <laughs> I will have a, another interview very soon. And ex more than the meaning of life, we've yes. also covered a lot of the economics. Yes. Uh, thank you so much. It's a thank pleasure. Thank you so much. Thanks. <laughs> Perfect. It worked. John, John Hagelin is uh, to be around. Yeah. Did you like it? Yes. Yes. Thank you.
Oh, is it different things? So what time do we have? What time uh, is it now? Nine something. The something is important. Uh, nine six. Nine oh six. Nine oh six.
I made a presentation about sustainability and awakening and that the notion of fear and love is something that can guide us to, to a sort of enlightenment and the rest of it and to do the subject and objects uh, realms. In Sweden we like to techno fix so that we can uh, stay with the same consumption. Yes. Nothing out there will change very much before something in here has changed. That's the key point. So, so what I think of is, is another kind of identity. Yes. Uh, which we have to remember. Yeah. Very good. I think personally the most important thing in the world of sustainability is to create a sustainable consciousness mm -hmm. and by that I mean our awareness is so narrowly restricted by the very functioning of our brains by the way we've been educated by the effects of stress on the brain mm -hmm. that people's comprehension is really quite narrowly restricted to whatever you're paying attention on it tends to be very short-range mm -hmm self-centered and obviously we need a longer term vision and a broader comprehension we really want global thinking global awareness where we can see the implications of our actions broadly and long term that's the fundamental shift that has to take place now the development of consciousness and a technique for transcending like transcendental meditation what it does is it takes that narrowly constricted awareness and through techniques it allows the awareness to withdraw from that sharp focus temporarily mm -hmm. withdraw from that sharp focus and start to expand and relax and withdraw from that focus and expand and expand and expand to become literally unbounded and that is what you mean by transcending yes transcending away one way to think about it is the narrowly localized attention start to diffuse and expand and fuse, become more comprehensive, more comprehensive, and then completely global, even universal. And then, of course, we're back in activity. But what happens is the expanded comprehension becomes more and more permanent. It affects our thinking, even affects our physiology. For example, even the eyes get used to seeing things very narrowly. Peripheral vision is very blurry for most people. With expanded comprehension and increased parallel processing in the brain, with global EEG coherence, where the whole brain is engaged, literally we have the breadth of comprehension and computing power where we can actually see everything even the periphery. And the eyes begin to adapt to produce more rods and cones outside of the central focus uh -huh. and everything starts to be crystal clear. That's just a symptom of the broader comprehension that comes with regular meditation. That's what's important. Otherwise, you know, you try to teach big principles to people whose awareness is too narrow to absorb those deep principles and it's a fighting a losing battle. And the principles of sustainability are so important but it's also important that people really get those principles. They resonate with them, and yeah. they act almost automatically in tune with those principles. So now you're describing a method that would sort of automatically turn us into another mode of mm -hmm. operating, mm -hmm. and possibly also another kind of identity. Yeah. Some, some deeper identity that was already there, of course, because you're not adding anything, really, by meditating. You're just you're adding awareness of it. Yeah. Adding awareness of it. You're right. Reducing I mean, we the stress. are by nature. Yeah, it's true. Stress physiologically binds the attention. Yeah. I mean, under stress, our higher brain, our expanded comprehension shuts down, and we get into a fight or flight very narrow yeah. reactive mode in the absence of stress the prefrontal cortex starts to function and we start to think more expansively long-term thinking long-term thinking and planning are entirely due to this the prefrontal cortex under stress it shuts down so it is a transformation of the brain and it's a transformation 
which it's really nothing more than the expansion of comprehension. And I find as an educator that people's ability to comprehend big concepts is very limited. Mm. But when the comprehension is expanded, of course it's all common sense. Yeah. We need to make sustainable behavior, long-term thinking, seven-generation thinking, yeah. common sense for people. And that really does require some culturing of the brain. And as you say, yes, identifying with levels of our reality that are bigger, yeah. that are global, yeah. and not so narrowly personal. Would you have an idea about how this would, would uh, turn out in, 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 in real terms? How mm -hmm. can we be so unified that we can agree globally in, in, in what needs to be? Because right now, of course, we have corporations fighting environmentalists and we have some countries fighting others. Yeah. The, the United States is very much in the grip of corporate influences and tend to resist many important environmental changes. Yeah, what we really need is to expand the comprehension of everyone, including the leadership. And the way that's going to happen, I believe, and it is beginning to happen, I'm very excited about it, is finally the incorporation of transcending meditation into schools. Now, I work with the David Lynch Foundation, which was created by the, the great filmmaker David Lynch, and that foundation is created to bring meditation to all school children throughout the world. Hmm. In the last couple of years, about a million children in a thousand schools in the U.S. and South America, mostly. These schools have incorporated regular meditation into the curriculum. Hmm. And uh, the whole school have, have adopted it. And the effects on the schools is so extraordinary in terms of academic achievement and graduation rates and suspension rates and so forth that it's spreading so quickly. And I do think um, a million children is quite a lot for the first couple of years, but I think it's going to be a billion children in my lifetime, which pretty means that pretty much means that education everywhere will incorporate actually incorporate techniques to develop the brain and to expand comprehension. Otherwise, we've spent so many years in school, mm -hmm. 10, 12, 15 years in school, to develop the brain, mm -hmm. and conventional education really does not fundamentally develop the brain. That's what has to change. If we're using 5% of our brain, we're going to get the same result that we've gotten generation after generation. And now we've been mainly talking about the, the ability to think uh, ex uber rationally, yeah. sort of, uh, which is also connected to emotion. We mentioned it the is. stress that that uh, narrows our, our vision. Exactly. So, so uh, in the bottom, it, it's really it's connected an emotional to change as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because our emotions also, under stress, become so self-defensive. Yeah. And in the absence of stress, what starts to flow more is the unifying value of emotions generally experienced is love and love of other love of environment love of other cultures love of the earth uh, these are all expressions of a more balanced heart and mind and yes certainly meditation and, will and our that. natural state when we don't mm. feel separation for some reason that's right that's right. Honestly, even enlightenment is just our natural state. Yeah. If you take the fully balanced functioning of the brain, yeah. it's integrated and not chaotic. Enlightenment is the spontaneous side effect of a balanced brain. Mm. You're quite right. You're quite right. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, My John pleasure. Hagelin. My pleasure. It's Thank good you. to be here with you. All right, well, thank you. I'm going to race to the airport. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>